This is where you go to sign up for any of the updates that we are passing out. So please go sign up for our under student populations. You go to at risk and highly mobile student programs division, sign up for those foster care and student success guide updates, sign up for McKinney Bento homeless education, mental health behavioral and military connected. If when we send out anything from the agency, all of those who have signed up, you will be able to receive those automatically. So please sign up for our updates because recently I've sent out the announcement of all the dates for the rest of the guide. So you can go ahead and sign up now for all the information about the rest of the foster care training guide series. So for the icons within the guide, the table of contents and the chapters are grouped by color. So there are four main topics by those colors. The preface, appendices, and references are orange. And then we have our overview, which is green. We have our cross systems and collaboration, which is purple. And then we have our district and LEA, local education agency responsibilities, which are blue. So each chapter is color coded. So that is to help you understand what are we trying to get you to see with this chapter. So make sure you are paying attention to that part. Also, we use icons within each one of these chapters. Please make sure you are looking at the icons and the types of icons. The icons indicate the type of content throughout the guide. So we have tips, reminders, collaboration, ways that you can collaborate, um, notes. We provide you notes within there. Also, the law. We want to make sure that you understand the reason why we are saying certain things, the law, the resources that we provided for you, any new items that are new to this guide that was not in the last guide, and then also any best practices that districts are currently using that have been working for them. So we included them in this guide. Also at the bottom of each one of our pages at the bottom right hand corner, I have the page number where I am talking about within the guide. So if you have the guide printed out, I have the page number where I'm speaking about this information. You can go and highlight certain information because all the key information that I will be highlighting today through this um, webinar is key information that, that will assist you in working with students in foster care. So please follow along with me as we go through. So I want to make sure you understand the table of contents. We have our chapters and then we have our sub subsections that are all hyperlinked. So you are able to go directly to that page. So if you have this downloaded on your um, desktop or laptop, you can go directly and click on those links and go directly to that section as we made it electronic. So please make sure you understand that. And this is a way to make it easier for you to go straight directly to the information that you are looking for at the time. And this information is on pages five through eight. And that's our table of contents. So where can you get more information about foster care from TEA? I'm glad you asked. So please visit our foster care and student success webpage. It is on TEA's main page. So you look for T foster care and student success. Also, please subscribe to our foster care and student success newsletters. And I showed you how you can subscribe for updates. And then if you need to email, if you have any questions or certain scenarios that you would like more guidance on, please email fostercareliaison at tea.texas.gov. So now let's go into chapter seven. So chapter seven is about identifying students and maintaining that confidentiality. So we want to make sure in this chapter, some topics that we will be covering, each one of these subsection topics, we will be covering that. Reasons why schools must identify students in foster care. We will talk about acceptable documents for identifying students at enrollment. Also foster care and PEAMS coding, which is very important. Then we will discuss FERPA and information sharing for students in foster care. Then we'll talk about practices to identifying students and ensuring confidentiality. 
and then communicating the need to know information. Remember, sometimes you only need to communicate certain things about students that need to know. And um, chapter seven starts on page 78. So now let's start talking about reasons why schools must identify students in foster care. Pursuant to the Every Student Succeeds Act, ESSA in 2015, the Fostering Connections to Students and Increasing Adop Adoptions Act of 2008, and also the Texas law. This is the main reason why we must ensure confidentiality. All of these laws require accommodations for students in foster care. If they are not classified, how can we serve them? So make sure we must classify those students. Transportation plans for students must be developed for all students in foster care if needed. And the reason why is because of ESSA. ESSA required transportation plans to be developed for students. Ensuring that students can remain in their school of origin unless it is not in their best interest is federal and state law. So school of origin is a federal and state law. Next, providing assistance for students transitioning from one school to another school, such as enrollment conferences, um, transferring of records, award of credits, these are what are your what are your local procedures for lessening the adverse impact on moving to a new school. So what are your local processes for assisting students who are moving from school to school? That is student transition. So you should have some things in place to ease those students transitions from one school to another school. Supportive educational services. Implementing educational supports available for students in foster care, such as compensatory services, tutorings, credit recovery programs, all of those are essential to helping students as they are supporting those educational services as they come to our campuses. Next, for truant counseling. Additional counseling for students who are truant, and this is by state law. So if you have a student who has high truancy, there must be some supports in place to help that student to ensure that they are meeting their goals on campus. Next, by identifying students in foster care, you must know that and assist them with helping them enroll in the National School Lunch Program and also school breakfast program. So students who are enrolled in foster care are or make sure they are enrolled in National School Lunch Program also because they receive school lunch free based upon their foster care status. Next, establish enrollment and education decision maker by DFPS, establishing proof of legal authority of a caregiver and of CPS and enrollment to and education decision making. So, 2085 and 2085 E, which we will discuss in this training, that is how you enroll students and give them that classification of student in foster care. And then lastly, informing students, 11th and 12th grade students about higher education tuition and fee waiver and other resources available to support students with post-secondary options and post-secondary support. They have great supports for students in foster care, but if you do not identify them, it is hard for those students to receive those supports. So make sure we are identifying students in foster care is very important so that they can take advantage of all of supports that are out there. So reasons why schools must identify students in foster care. A helpful tip is to make sure you are maintaining confidentiality and protecting dignity and the privacy of the students. Only provide information to those who need to know the background of that foster care student in order to provide supports. Everyone does not need to know the, the privacy information of that student. So that's why we need to make sure we protect that confidentiality. LEA must maintain confidentiality information shared 
and used only for purposes of supporting the child's education and well-being. So what are your local practices and procedures to ensuring that the student's information is not all over the school? Those who work with students in foster care must maintain the confidentiality. So make sure you are, are looking at your protocols in your schools now. How are you maintaining that student confidentiality based upon your district's protocols? So now let's look at acceptable documents for identifying students at enrollment. So DF, DFPS provides one of three documents to schools to confirm that the student is in foster care and the caregiver has the authority to enroll the student. So DFPS, they either have the placement authorization form, which is the 2085, or they'll even provide the the DFPS designation of the education decision maker form, which we call the 2085E, or they have a court order. So now let's take a look at each one of these because we want to make sure that we know the proper way to identify students in foster care. So when you, when you talk and want to to say, oh, how do we identify students in foster care? We give them that foster care indicator. These are the ways, the paperwork, the proper documentation to use to give foster care indicator and PINs for students in foster care. You'll have a 2085, you have a 2085E, or you have a court order. And I am on page eight. Now let's look at the forms. Let's look at our placement authorization form, that 2085. So the court ordered authority to make day-to-day -day decisions regarding a child to an individual, usually a caregiver, such as a foster parent. So this document gives the, the caregiver the authority to make day-to-day -day decisions for the student. The 2085 form is the agency's legal authorization and is preferred by DFPS, and it prefers by DFPS to assist evidence of conservatorship. So this is the form that DFPS uses to show that the student is currently in conservatorship. So it is also used for enrollment of students in school. So this form, so I wanted to provide you what does example of this form look like? It is in the appendix of our foster care guide. It is appendix E on page 163 in the, in the appendix in our foster care guide. So we want to make sure that you know what this guide looked like and what to expect when you receive this, this actual form. So make sure you can actually read the signature so you know who to contact when any decisions for the child need to be made. So make sure that they are signed. If they are not signed, please talk to either the caseworker or the caregiver. They must be signed in order to be valid. So now let's go into the 2085E. The 2085E, this form also provides legal authority to the guardian. DFPS is required by law to ensure that the school receives this form for information. The education decision maker must be notified by the school about any actions that will impact the student's education. So this sample form is in our appendix also. We wanted to make sure that you see and you understand what this form is for. It is appendix F on page 164 of the guide. So please ensure that you can read this form, that you see signatures on this form. This is the proper authority given to that person, given to the guardian by DFPS and the courts. We need to make sure that you see this information. So 
So now court orders. Let's go back. Went too fast. Let's go for court orders. So court orders, if the caregiver does not have either the 2085 or the 2085E, a school official, you can request a copy of the court order. So this document names DFPS as the temporary managing conservator or the permanent managing conservator of that student. And schools may, and you can use the court order to confirm the educational decision maker for the student. So if you do not have the 2085 or the 2085E, you can request the court order that gave conservatorship to DFPS. So we want to make sure that you know you have these options. Please speak to your caseworker that is on the documentation, or you can also reach out to your DFPS educational specialist. They may also be able to assist you, but you can use the court order to also give PEAN's identification code for foster care. You can give that foster care indicator with court orders also. So now court orders and confidentiality. So we want to give you a reminder, remember our icons, a reminder that the court orders have private and confidential information related to the student in it. Please ensure that your LEA has procedures related to confidentiality for student records. So I spoke about that earlier. What is your district's protocols regarding student confidentiality paperwork? So please make sure you are following those. And also a tip, the green flag, we wanna make sure a tip is that schools may request the 2085, the 2085E or the court order. Um, you can contact that either by DFPS or community-based care worker, case, care case worker, or also your regional DFPS educational specialist. All of this information is on page 80 in the foster care and student success guide. So make sure you know you have options to reach your DFPS educational specialist. Also at every region, we have ESC foster care champions who are in communication with their DFPS regional educational specialist. There are ways to get to personnel who you can contact to ensure that you are making the right decision and have the right paperwork to make that decision. So now let's go into um, foster care and PEAMS coding. Let's talk about foster care and PEAMS coding. And I'm on page 81 at this time. So federal and state laws require that TEA, they, we must collect and report data on students in foster care. So this is new guidance. So we just want to put this out there. That's why you see the, the, the blue bell. This is new guidance that was not in the last guide. This is new for this guide. Um, the data is reported to TEA by districts, by LEAs, using the Public Education Information Management System. So we call it PEAMS. So just want to make sure everyone knew what PEAMS meant. So it's the Public Education Information Management System. So we, schools must enter the foster care indicator code into PEAMS of students who are currently in conservatorship of DFPS. And also down there, pre-kindergarten students, they will be coded if they were previously in foster care. So if you get a pre-K student at your school, make sure you are showing that foster care indicator if you have appropriate documentation for that student in PEAMS. Um, identification helps TEA and the LEA collect and report academic achievement, graduation rates, and students in foster care by ESSA. We ask this information because it is, it is federally mandated that we report this information. So we want to make sure we provide all the information that we need. So you must make sure you are coding students correctly. I just went over the paperwork that you needed to code the students. So now you make sure you code them correctly.
So now let's talk about some scenarios that may happen regarding PEAMS coding. So if a student leaves foster care within the school year, do they remain coded for the remainder of the school year? So if they leave foster care within the school year, do they remain coded for that particular school year? Yes, they do. When a student receives that foster care PEAMS indicator code, the student remains coded for the full school year and the summer months, even if the student leaves foster care within the school year. So it lasts for one school year from the beginning date from the first date of school to the end date of the end of the school year. That student stays coded. So at the beginning of the next school year, there should be a confirmation that the student is still within foster care or not to get that coding for the new school year. So please pay attention to the wordings of this, of, of this information. We wanted to provide you with this because we do receive questions about this. Also, if a student remains in foster care, does the foster care indicator carry over from year to year? No, it does not. The foster care indicator does not carry over from year to year. The student must re-identify MPs at the beginning of the school year. So you must re-identify students at the beginning of every school year. So if you ran a list at the end of the 2021-22 school year, and you have your list of foster care students, at the beginning of 2022-2023 school year, you should go and make sure to verify that all those students are still with are still in conservatorship. Because remember, foster care is a temporary placement. So those students may not be in foster care anymore. So you do, you do not carry that over from year to year. And this information is on page 81. And for the paperwork, the paperwork does not carry over from year to year. You can receive an updated 2085 form for those students for the new year. So remember, your form should be dated within that school year. So if you have that school, if, if the student comes to you in August for that school year, that student is labeled foster care. But for the next school year, there should be an updated form that states the student is still there or is not. So make sure you are checking those forms and those dates. Removal from foster care. Look back at the first question. Remember, if a student leaves foster care within the school year, do they remain coded? They remain coded for the entire school year. So you just know for the next school year, they will not be coded. So please make sure you are looking at this information within. So should they receive a new one, they should be updated. So make sure you are speaking to your DFPS foster care um, your caseworkers, your DFP, you must have communication. Please make sure you have communication. Sometimes are they giving you everything that you need if you're not asking it? You need to ask and be in communication. Do you want to run a list of your students at foster care each month and check on them? Yes, you should have someone checking on your students monthly for foster care. Are they still in foster care? Did something happen to them? Are they not in CPS custody anymore? You can check on that information. Run list of your students who are PEAMS indicated. Um, you have a foster care PEAMS indicator. Make sure you're running list. Make sure you're checking on your students. If you check on them students from month to month and you find out something is happening, then there's your answer to your question. So you should be asking students for information. So now let's go and now, now I'm on page 81 to 82. Let's talk about foster care and PEAMS. So identifying students in foster care for compensatory education. Remember, there are funds. You have title funds for students. You compensatory education funds for students. Please do not have time 
please do not look and make sure you are viewing those opportunities to get students information, tutoring supports, any of those information. So DFPS conservatorship, students are considered at risk of dropping out of school for the purposes of TEC section 29.081. So if some of your foster students can receive at-risk codes, so those at-risk codes, here we have an at-risk code of 11. So for the at-risk code of 11, this it either the custody or the care of DPS or has during the school year been referred to a department by a school official officer of juvenile court or law enforcement. So this is a way they can receive a PEANS at-risk code of 11. So students in foster care or who were previously in foster care are coded under a 13. So they, they resided in the preceding school year or resides in the current school year in a residential facility in a district. So you have these codes and we wanted to make sure we provided you more information about compensatory education. So please see our TEA state website about state compensatory education and things you can do to help students um, with, the, with tutoring supports and getting any other supports that they may need. If out-of-state students are coming to us, do you have the 2085 for those students? Remember, 2085 is the foster care indicator. Now, if you have out-of-state students who are getting coded for at risk for a current school year, either for code 1113C, if they meet any of these requirements that I just stated for either code 11 or code 13. See your compensatory education administrator within your district to get more information of how students could be coded at risk. So now let's talk about FERPA and information sharing for students in foster care. Remember, we have the, that information for information, the Federal Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, which we call FERPA, is the privacy law that governs an education agency or institution that receives federal funds under a program administered by the Secretary of Education. So FERPA applies to all, all schools who receive federal funds given by the Secretary of Education. So we just, I wanted you to understand what the reason, because we say FERPA a lot, but do you know what FERPA means? So FERPA requires that parental consent before a school can share any personal identifiable information in education records about the student, but there are some exceptions to that. So make sure that FERPA allows the school to share information with the student's state or local child welfare case workers without, oops, sorry. without requiring those permissions of the family. So remember, there are certain things for FERPA that do apply. So make sure you are viewing that information regarding FERPA. So now let's talk about FERPA and foster care. I am on page 83 in the guide. We are moving along here. So Texas law. So remember when you see that the orange scales of law, Texas law requires that the school districts and local campuses to notify the student's educational decision maker and the caseworker regarding events that may significantly impact the education of the student in foster care. So if anything is happening on campus for that student, if uh, the decision that needs to be made about the student or anything that impacts that student educational process, contact should be made with the educational decision maker. Who is that person? You received the 2085E. The person that is listed on the 2085E as the education decision maker, that's who you need to contact. So make sure you have the proper paperwork in order to understand who to contact in any instances because it is Texas law.
So now we wanted to provide you resources and information about share about information sharing um, on FERPA and information sharing. This is one, there are plenty that's in the book, but this is a key one. The information sharing between child welfare and schools is one that is that provides you federal information about information sharing. And then the last one is the Legal Center for Foster Care and Education Uninterrupted Scholars Act video. So that provides you more inf information about any laws that have been enacted regarding foster care and foster care and education. So now in the chat, did you see anything that was new to you? Because I know I've been getting questions and I'm trying to answer some of those questions. Will all your questions be answered today? No. Please reach out to foster care liaison at tea.texas.gov if today I don't answer all your questions um, and we will get those questions answered. So don't, don't feel bad if we don't answer all of your questions today. We will try to answer most of the questions that we've received today. So just based upon what we talked about so far, was anything new to you that you have not heard of in chapter seven? You can put that in the chat now. So very good. Hopefully that means you read chapter seven before you came to this webinar today. So that's what I'm taking. Make sure you are looking at information. So I see information about getting hold of caseworkers. We do have regional DFPS educational specialists who are actually in this webinar right now. They are able to assist you. Their information is in the guide also. There's a link to a, a regional DFPS educational specialists that are able to assist you with obtaining those 2085 and those 2085 e forms. Make sure you're trying to under to get in contact with those caseworkers first because you have their name listed on those forms. Make sure you try to get in contact with them first. If you cannot, you can always reach out to your DFPS educational specialist. So for when our local children's home has a CPS placement, it's CPS placement conservatorship. Remember, there's a difference. Just because they have CPS information does not mean that is conservatorship. Do they have a 2085 or 2085E? That is different. Any other about compensatory education coding, please see your compensatory education um, administrator on your campus. So I see we have a shout out already for our DFPS educational specialist, Ms. Puentes. They are out there, they are able to help. Please contact your ESC foster care champion because they do have meetings. They have meetings You can for all your their LEAs in that area and those DFPS educational specialists attend those meetings sometimes. They have joint meetings. So you can get out and meet those personnel and make contact with people. So please make sure you're reaching out. There are supports in place for you. Based upon the foster care guide, the foster care guide that just came out in 2022, the 2085 paperwork should be updated because foster care is a temporary placement. So thank you all for putting this information in the chat. So now let's move on. So practices for identifying students and ensuring that confidentiality. So there are a lot in the, the foster care guide. I'm just gonna highlight a few right now. Um, students who are currently or formerly in foster care generally express a desire to have their foster care status kept private from school staff and peers. 
students do not want everyone to know that they are in foster care. So please make sure you are respecting that student's right to privacy. Only indicate information if it needs to be indicated. So please make sure you are respecting that student's privacy. Also file those forms, tracking logs, notebooks, and data safety out of view of other students. Do not have a student's file sitting out. That is not respecting that privacy or ensuring confidentiality. Please make sure you have local practices for um, confidentiality and respecting that. Also keep the record secure from individuals who do not need to know the student is in foster care. So their records should not be all over the place. When they come register, you should not just yell to everybody, here's a 2085. We have a person with a 2085. This is confidential information and we want to respect those students' right to privacy because you do not know all the trauma that came with going on with that, that coding. So please respect that. Also, all written information with student names should be password protected or locked in files in order to avoid confidentiality violations. So remember those FERPA laws that I talked about earlier. We do not want to break those federal FERPA laws. So make sure that things are protected. And then lastly, protecting the student's privacy applies to oral and written communications. So if you're talking about a student, make sure you are in a, a private location where everyone does not hear the conversation. We want to ensure that students have that privacy and that information about them is private and only spoken to the personnel who needs to know. So foster care and confidentiality again, ways to provide opportunity to promote confidentiality. Make sure you develop that training. Training and will increase that awareness with school registers and those front office staff on how to effectively identify and enroll students in foster care and inform the LEA foster care liaison about the students. So the foster care liaison should be making sure they are training school registers and those front office staff of how to be responsible with students in foster care's information. The information should not be out there. It should not be sitting around. The information is private and to make sure that we are increasing that awareness of that confidentiality. Also add a question to the LEA's existing student residency questionnaire. So the SRQ that asks if the student is foster care. And you can even say, is this student currently in conservatorship? So you didn't even mention foster care, you mentioned conservatorship. And remember those 2085s and 2085E can confirm conservator conservatorship. So if they happen to check yes on that box, follow up and make sure you receive that proper identification information. Also ask a question to the school enrollment form that discreetly identifies student. Use language other than foster care to maintain privacy. Remember, I just spoke about using the word conservatorship because as soon as you see that, that means something to you within the foster care realm. Also document the caseworker's name and contact information in the student's records in case further information or follow-up is needed. So in order to make sure you follow up, make sure that caseworker's name and contact information that you can actually read it on those 2085s and 2085E forms. Make sure when you receive that documentation, make sure you can read everything. And if you have any questions, ask them at that time you receive it to ensure that you have everything that you need. And then streamline the process with the LEA Child Nutrition Coordinator to ensure students are immediately enrolled and receive the free school meal program for further application. They, do, they must receive that as soon as they enroll. Remember, immediate enrollment also includes immediate enrollment in those nutrition programs. So do you have processes in place to ensure that students are receiving those, those nutrition benefits as soon as they enroll and you have confirmed um, and you have confirmed the um, proper coding. So communicating need to know information. So how do you make sure you are communicating that need to know information? 
confidentiality in school information sharing within the school district. What is your processes? How are you doing those processes? Do everyone know those processes in place? And they are in place because you said them, are they actually being done? So make sure you have confidentiality and information sharing within the school district. Also, those who may need to know the information, school personnel, the, they need to know information regarding the students. The principal may need to know. The school counselor needs to know in order to make sure that they, the students receive all the, the benefits, they know any post-secondary information that they may need to know, credit recovery if possible, and then the award of credit. So those school counselors need to know information about the students the special education staff. So is, is the student who is currently in foster care, are they receiving special education services? You need to make sure you're in contact with the special education staff. And then teachers, if there are any instances that the student may need to leave off campus because of certain appointments that are happening, make sure you are communicating with the teachers about the reasons why the student may be leaving off campus, but make sure you are sharing the information within confidentiality. Also, who needs to know? The cafeteria staff need to know so they can ensure that that student is receiving those free nutrition benefits. And then coaches. So if the student is actually participating in extracurricular activities, the coaches may need to know in order to make sure they have those supports for that student within that realm. Also, front office staff. They need to know to make sure that they are having any information with the student that they are handling in an appropriate manner. And then bus drivers. So if the bus driver has uh, knows that that student is in conservatorship, if they need to know, remember need to know basis, if they need to know that information to see how the student is being dropped off or any information for that student. So make sure you are following that information. And, and it goes further into detail on page 85. So confidentiality in foster care. Schools need to know when a student is in foster care and are responsible for protecting the confidentiality of the information. So there should be no reason why the whole campus knows that a student is in foster care. There should be no reason why. Only personnel who needs to know who is working with that student should be in the know about the foster care status. Schools should always be sensitive to the student's desire for privacy and should not share the information with any parties who do not need to know. So please respect the student's privacy. We actually had this situation happen to where information got out that the student was in conservatorship and the student was embarrassed because they did not want everyone to know. So we say this information for a reason because it has happened. So please follow your procedures in place, protect those students, be sensitive to the students' desires of not even wanting everybody to know about their business, especially about the reasons why they may be in foster care. We want to respect that privacy. And then decisions to share confidential information must be made on a case-by-case -case basis. Remember certain reasons why you may share this information. It, it may be on a need no basis, but sharing only minimal information is necessary and only to individuals who need to know so they can support the student. We, we only want to share information because it will help the student. So appropriate to share for DFPS to share information. So we we are we built this this actual foster care guide with support of DFPS. So DFPS is now telling you what information is appropriate for them to share. So it is appropriate for the 2085, the 2085 E or the court order. They can share all of that information with you. So if you are if you don't have it, don't receive it. Make sure you reach out to DFPS. Um, the DFPS, a community-based care worker, they, their information, it is appropriate for them to share that with you if you have any questions. Also, DFPS conservatorship and living in foster home or relative kinship care placement. So any of those placements, they can share that information with you. 
Also, they can willingly share the birth certificate, immunization records, names of any previous schools so you can get that information from previous schools, transcripts, report cards, if they have any IEPs, any 504 plans in place from previous schools and any special education records. The DFPS, if they have this information, they can willingly share it with the new school. And then also medications for the students that are administered by the school nurse with a doctor's written orders. So make sure they can share this information with the school. So now case by case determination. So how do you determine case by case if I'm going to tell this student's information or not? So information that may be shared with relevant school personnel if related to the school's the, the students care and needs in the educational setting. So these are things that the school personnel can share, but you make sure you determine if you need to share it by case by case determination, any medical disability or any health information, any mental or behavioral health issues, services and medications that are not administered at school. So this, the, this is information that is that, sh, that with relevant school personnel, it can be shared. The effects of trauma and potential triggering events that may cause a behavioral response. So that information needs to be shared with school personnel so they can equip themselves for any possibility of anything that may happen. Any psychological evaluations that may have happened with the student before they came to that school the school should know about this information. Any behavioral supports that were used by the caregiver to encourage consistency in the school and the home environments. So anything that is working at the home that the caregivers should give the school personnel information about that so they can keep continue those supports so to increase that consistency and support that student. And then if, if there is an arrest record, the school needs to know this information. So please, this is case by case information that may be shared with school personnel. So here we go. It is never appropriate to share with school personnel. Here are some things that should not be shared with school personnel. Any abuse or neglect history. That is not important for the school personnel to know. The name of the person reported the abuse or neglect if known, that is not important to share. Details of DSPS abuse or neglect investigation. The school does not need to know about the investigation. Any alcohol or substance abuse history, treatment of the student, unless clearly relevant, only if released is specifically consented by the student. So make sure you understand what that just said. Alcohol and substance abuse history and treatment of the student, unless clearly relevant, and only if it is, only if the release is specifically consented by the student. So if the student says that it's okay for someone to know about that, they have just given consent. So also the foster care's family income, that is, no, that is not for the school personnel to know. That is not important. And then lastly, the fact that the student was adopted. Now, it is never appropriate for to share with school personnel. So we want to make sure we give you this information so you understand why you may not receive all of the information because based upon confidentiality and privacy. So now we have covered all the information in chapter seven. We went through every detail and covered the information, but this does not this does not stress from going you going back and going through the information. And hopefully you followed along and highlighted some information that was important that you read about. Because anytime you may reach out to foster care liaison at tea.texas.gov, every single time I will give you something out of the foster care guide that gives you guidance on what you need to do. So everything that I provide information for comes from this foster care guide. So what information are you going to share from today's training? 
So going back to your LEAs, what are you going to share with them today that you got from this training today? Because I, I've given a lot of information through chapter seven. Chapter seven was strictly about confidentiality and privacy. What are you going to take back to your districts? A question that I will ask to you and pose, well, what are your district's um, procedures on privacy and confidentiality? So we wanted to make sure that you had this information and that everyone knows this information. A key thing to also do is take back training. What trainings are you having about confidentiality? PEAMS coding is very important because students in foster care receive a lot of, of information and a lot of supports even after they have exited um, foster care, if they're no longer in foster care, if they once was in foster care, they can still receive supports and, and like tuition and fee waiver, they can still receive that. But if they have that support from the school to say, oh, they were PEAMS coded in the 10th grade as foster care. It just, it just initiated that um, tuition and fee waiver. So I am so glad that you're going through and finding that it is it is very important to make sure you are PEAMS coding our students in foster care correctly. So the need, the need to be do awareness sensitivity training, yes. So what is your district now about awareness? What are you doing now about awareness and sensitivity training regarding any documentation for students? What are you doing to make sure that you are having that information for those students? So this is very important. So now I want to provide you with an update for our upcoming foster care trainings. So chapters eight and nine will be this month, October 28th. We, I will cover two chapters at one time. So chapters eight and nine will be covered October 28, 2022 from 10 to 11.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. So I just want to make sure I put that on there. And then chapter 10 will be October, I mean, December the 20, the, December the 2nd, 2022. So if you received the announcement, it has given you the rest of the, the dates for the rest of the trainings for the rest of this school year. So all the way to chapter 13. So please make sure you sign up for those updates and please go register on our website. Our Foster Care and Student Success website, as soon as you go on it, the links are there for you to register for the upcoming trainings. So now if you have any questions, if you have any further questions and you want more information about something that I said about today, please reach out to fostercareliaison at tea.texas.gov. Please make sure you reach out. Um, I answer all those questions. I make sure if I can't find the answer for it, I make sure I give you the answer. And if you need further, we can always reach out and schedule a call or information like that. So we want, I want to make sure you have all the information you need to be successful as we help our students in foster care. So if you have any questions or any concerns based upon anything that you heard today or even any scenarios that you have on your campuses, please reach out to foster care liaison at tea.texas.gov. So before you go, please make sure you fill out our survey. Our survey helps us to understand what are your needs in the field. Please make sure you give us feedback, provide plenty of feedback to let us know what we can do to help with um, future trainings, um, in information about this training. Please make sure you are providing that feedback to us. So we appreciate everyone for coming today. Um, if you have any questions or comments or concerns, please make sure you are reaching out to us, um, foster care liaison at tea.texas.gov, and we will make sure we give you those information. So we want to thank you all for coming today. We want to make sure we get you in and get you out at a good time. Hopefully you receive all the information that you were able 
to, to, to get from chapter seven training. Hopefully you're able to follow through the guide because that's what I want these guide trainings to be where you can follow through the guide and use your time wisely to understand the information that is in that section. So I hope to see you all back for chapters eight and nine on October 28th. Make sure you go and register. Also send this information to others who you feel would be beneficial from hearing this training. So please make sure you go out and share this information with others, invite them to come to the trainings, pass along the foster care guide and ensure that everyone has information. Remember this training will be archived on our website. The, pre this, the slide deck and the, um, the recording will be uploaded on our TEA website. So if you did not see the overview training and trainings for chapters one through six, they are all on our foster care um, website right now under webinars. And you can go on there and go back and view each one of those at your leisure. So this one also be uploaded too. So thank you all for coming today. Um, I appreciate you. Thank you for the, the feedback and the comments in the chat. Um, we do see those. So please make sure you are emailing foster care and I'll put it in the chat, foster care liaison at tea.texas.gov for any questions or any concerns that you have um, even after this. So thank you all for coming today. So please make sure you fill out the um, survey for us.